All right, welcome back to Fiction Author Business School. I've got a little bit of a different kind of episode for you today. I very rarely do interviews on my podcast anymore. I used to. I used to do them a lot, you know, in the first year or so that I was on when I didn't really know what my podcast was supposed to be about. (laughs) But now I do mostly solo episodes. Anyone who's returning will know that. I just talk about fiction writing, different aspects of it, how to do certain things. Um, And I know that a lot of you want me to focus more on marketing. I probably will in the future, though not right away. Um... I focus more on the writing, but if you are interested in the marketing, then this is definitely an episode that you're going to want to pay attention to. I am interviewing J- Dave Chesson, which I have interviewed him before, and he is talking about um, some changes at Amazon that they are not making public. So Dave has always been a pioneer for uh, self-published authors, and he was one of the first people I started following once I got into the business, which was more than 10 years ago. He uh, ran a site called Kindlepreneur, and... He, back then, was creating lists of the best promo sites for your books and ranking them, you know, so that authors would know what was um, worth their time and money and what wasn't and what kind of results to expect. So he's always just done things to serve authors and to make the self-publishing process easier to understand and, you know, giving us tools throughout the years that will just make everything go a little bit more smoothly for us. So we love him, and he does a great job for us, and he does lots of great things. Well... He's also something of an expert at Amazon, and he pays attention to the algorithm and to the changes that are being made to Amazon Publishing that most of us don't pay attention to. So um, I really want you to pay attention to this interview. He's going to tell us some really important things. Like I said, Amazon has made some sweeping changes to the way that it does its keywords for your books, and they are not making those changes public. So without Dave telling us these things, we would not know them. And without knowing them, it's going to be a lot harder to sell our books, okay? So without further ado, let's get into the interview with Dave. Hi there, aspiring fiction author. Welcome to Fiction Author Business School. Do you want to write your stories with ease and confidence? Do you find yourself Googling how to write a fiction book or how to write a character arc? you want to create a fiction empire, but you can't even finish the story you're currently working on, and you find yourself doubting it will even be good enough? Hi, I'm Liesl. I too have been writing stories since I was just a kid. I wanted to do something about my fiction writing dreams, but got information overload every time I looked for writing help, because there's just so much out there on the internet. I wanted confidence that I wouldn't disappoint my readers, and a plan to publish regularly. I knew the foundation of any author career, including the marketing aspect, is a stellar and well-written story, but I didn't know how to be sure that my story was solid. I went on a journey to figure out what really makes readers tick and how to incorporate those addictive elements into my story. In this podcast, you'll find specific tactical fiction writing tips, solutions to writing more words more efficiently, and secrets to mastering your author mindset. So put on your fuzzy slippers, grab a notebook and pen and some chocolate, and let's write some fiction. But yeah, um, we can just go ahead and get started. I mean, you have not been on for a little while on my podcast, so why don't you reintroduce yourself to my audience and then just kind of tell us what you're here to talk about. Sounds good. Well, I'm Dave Chesson, the founder of Kindlepreneur, as well as the founder of Publisher Rocket and the co-founder of Atticus. Um, I've been a longtime person in the industry, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I've w- been a consultant to major publishing companies as well as um, big time New York Times uh, bestselling authors um, from across many genres as well as subject matters. And um, I have had the pleasure of watching Amazon change over the years and trying to keep my finger on that pulse. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about the new Amazon category system. And while it seems like it's an amazing thing and it's going to be easier, it's actually a ticking time bomb. And there's a lot of things authors really need to know in order to best navigate and choose categories that benefit their books. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I mean, I got to say, I um, it was kind of funny because I heard about this and I think I heard about it on a different podcast and I think they were talking about a report or a post that you put out. And I was listening to it and going, huh, you know, it's been a while since I checked my categories. I kind of would need to do that, you know. And then it was like the, the next day, I think you reached out to me and asked if I wanted if you um, could come onto the podcast. And I was like, yes, actually, I want that for myself as well as my audience so that I can understand it better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's kind of shocking what Amazon's doing. And and uh, okay. it's a shame um, that they're not making this information public. 
And it's it's yeah. something that every author really needs to know or else they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. And I'm in the end, I think after everybody hears about this, it's it just kind of sucks. It's a, yeah. There's no better way to put it than that. That just sucks. Yeah. And I mean, maybe maybe we. this is a question I should wait until the end till everybody hears what you have to say. But why do you think Amazon's doing it if it's I mean, is it benefiting them on their side? If it's obviously not benefiting authors much. So. Uh, the best way to answer this is I'll probably start by talking about what the system used to be okay, and what it is now and my belief on why they made that change. Okay. Yeah. So, absolutely. so back in the day, as in like maybe six, you know, months ago or so uh, <laughs> at the time of this recording, Amazon had an, a uh, category system that was really confusing and somewhat ridiculous. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was that authors would go to publish their books and they could choose their categories. But what Amazon wasn't telling authors at that time was those were not Amazon categories. They were something called a BISAC. Right. And a BISAC is an international standardization uh, category system. And back in the day, uh, what happened was publishing companies would make up categories. And then they would give books and they would send it over to libraries or to bookstores and bookstores might not have a category for that. They might not have a shelf for this. And so it would be left to somebody who opens up the box to figure out where to put this book. And so a book with a category of Wiccan, you know, the shopper might or the, the bookstore might say, hmm, is that religious studies or is that fantasy or is that, you know, nonfiction, fiction? Like, what do we do with this? And so I'm because it was a logistics nightmare, they, the international system was created, the BISACs, so that publishers could only choose from a list of BISACs and stores could figure out based off of that where it should go in their individual store. So Amazon used to adopt this BISAC system, but it really sucked because Amazon wouldn't tell anybody that these were BISACs. And what's crazy is, is that there were 4,800 BISACs to choose from, but there were over 11,000 Amazon categories. Mm -hmm. So what happened was authors learned that when you go to publish a book, you would select a couple of BISACs, and then you could immediately go to the special form that Amazon does not make public. Um, and you could go fill it out and say, hey, Amazon, I want to be in these categories, these Amazon categories. And Amazon would have a human go in and they would enter in the information and they would then put your book in those. So the authors that were savvy and knew about this, they could get their books into maybe like five or 10 different categories and more importantly, know exactly what categories they're part of instead of being randomly put in things because of BISACs. Right. So recently, Amazon shifted away from the BISAC system. And now when you go to KDP and you go to select your categories, you actually see Amazon categories and you can select them. But Amazon said, hey, we only accept three categories and that's it. You get no more say. OK, you just get three and you're done. And our system automatically puts you in those. The second thing they did was they said, hey. We reserve the right to remove you from categories and put you in whatever we want. Which kind of sucks. But OK, mm -hmm. I get it a little bit. Um, and so all seem pretty well. And we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls to the system later. But okay. for the purpose of answering that question, um, they went from a system that required a whole bunch of humans to interact. And more and more authors figure this out. And more and more authors were filling out that form. And as we know, Amazon has been in major cost cutting measures. Um, they've been really trying to increase their profit margins. And so I believe two things came from this new system. Number one was they were able to let go of a whole bunch of, of support team members um, and cut the, the need to, because let's face it, Amazon doesn't really like to have to, have to do customer support. Um, right. It's one of the things they really hide. And this was probably one of those things that was taking up a lot of their resources. The second thing is, is that it's... Um, the second thing about this is that I believe that because authors had the rights to ask for whatever they wanted, I think there were a lot of authors that abused the system. Mm -hmm. And so they were maybe putting themselves like, for example, a long time ago, uh, the publisher behind Harry Potter got into, shall we say, PR trouble because they had placed Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone into the category of 
of nonfiction uh, orphan. So, uh, yeah, Harry Potter is an orphan, but clearly that's ridiculous. And they right. did that because then they were absolutely a number one bestseller no matter what. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people were doing kind of the same thing. And Amazon was like, hey, this is killing our category system. So let's just make it that authors can choose three and that's it. And we reserve the right to remove them if our algorithm thinks that they shouldn't be in this. So I believe that the system was made because of those things. Uh, I do have knowledge of the people in charge of moving to this new system. And it is my belief that Amazon fired them before the project was complete. Um, And I believe that the new category system is not going to be touched. And so the problems that exist will not be fixed. Um, A key Mm -hmm. example of this for anybody who's like, wait, how can you say that? There are six categories right now inside of Amazon KDP, where if you go and you find them, it will literally say the name of the category. And then in parentheses, it will say rename. As in their programmers left a note to themselves to rename that category. And nobody renamed it. And, it never and you got can done, still yeah. find them. Yep. One of them, uh, just off the top of my head, is Turtles. Turtles. Um, I think it's under nonfiction or maybe it's a fiction, but kids children's book or whatever. And you finally get down to Turtles. And it literally has a parentheses that says rename in all caps, rename. Um, So you find these things and you're just like, come on, you're supposed to be like this technological company and you can't even put together a category system. So a couple of questions about that. You said that they can only pick three categories now. Are they in more than three categories and they can only pick three or are they in three categories total? So what can happen is you choose three categories. Mm -hmm. And then what we've learned from Amazon is that they're going to use your metadata and everything else about your book to try to figure out if you really should be in that category. Okay. Right. Now, if they deem that you should be in those three categories, Amazon may decide to put you in more. And they may do that because they say, hey, your book is doing really well in these categories. And our historical data shows that books that do well here should also be here as well. And so we've seen Amazon go and add books to like four, five, six more, you know, categories um, just because. But we've also seen where if a book doesn't have metadata to support the categories they choose, then Amazon just removes them. And so your book may only be in one category or two or, you know, they may put you into something else and you're like, whoa, whoa, I did not ask for that. And that is not my book. How dare you? Uh, one of the big things that we learned, the one of the big things that trigger Amazon to keep you in or to remove you is the keywords that you choose. Uh, we found through experiment as well as through data collection that there are a bunch of keywords that help Amazon to say, oh, yeah, that book should be in this category because clearly the words that the authors use and describe fit this category. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that we added in Publisher Rocket, in our category feature, is that if you find a category that you like, you can click a button, you can see a list of all of the top keywords for that category. And we now recommend to authors that when you go to fill in your seven Kindle keyword boxes, right, those seven Kindle keyword boxes, you can put you can put in 50 characters inside of each. Mm-hmm. We recommend that you reserve two of those boxes to put in keywords that fit for your three categories. So okay. choose like two or three words from each of your three, put it in those two boxes, which you should be able to fit. And that's more than enough to convince Amazon that, OK, we'll keep this book in there. Um, this okay. is kind of like, for example, let's say, you know, you wrote a book on. On, um, let's say, sci fi military, OK, like it's a sci fi mm-hmm. military book, but it's also a, like a book about say a space marine who's in love with a woman back on earth and he's fighting for the ability to come home to her so yes it is sci-fi military but there's also a romance component to it well if you filled out all your keywords focusing on the sci-fi military aspects you know like space invasion you know intergalactic battles you know battle cruisers you know space marines blah 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 and you forget to put some of the romantic component to it And yet you select a category which shows like, you know, sci-fi romance, 
Amazon will remove you from it because you didn't speak or talk about romance enough for them to say that the book should be in there. And so a lot of authors are finding themselves choosing three and three days later, looking it up and finding out that they're, there are none of their categories. They're not in there. Mm-hmm. So if you get removed or if it puts you in a category that does not fit your book, is there a way to appeal it? No, uh, no. they do not allow you to communicate with them anymore. But what you can do is that if you find out, so for everybody listening, if you have published a book, I recommend there's, if you don't have published a rocket, there's a free tool out there. You can just, it's like nerdy book girl uh, category finder. If you type that into Google, you'll find it. You can put your ASIN number in there and you can see what currently Amazon's actually listing your book as. Okay, so you can check your categories. And if those categories are not the ones that you requested or you don't like them or you want to change them, you can go in your KDP and I recommend, again, select reselecting the three that you chose and then going in and changing your keywords. So two of those seven blocks to truly tell Amazon, hey, Amazon, I really should be in these categories. Have you found that doing that, it will work to get them into the right categories after a time? Generally, yes. Okay. Um, it It's not all the time. Uh, sometimes Amazon, like if Amazon's collected enough data or you've done this before or something of that matter, they'll, they'll still, you know, they can still basically stick to their ways. Yeah. But we've seen that a, especially with newer books that you have that ability to grab their attention and kind of shake them a little bit and be like, no, <laughs> put me back in this. Um. <laughs> So I, I think it's very important for authors to identify that as soon as possible and then take action on it. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. And let's talk about the metadata a little bit more because, I mean, are, do you recommend then that people, um, you know how some people will like keyword stuff their titles, they'll put in the title and then be like a a um, thrilling terrifying journey of a, you know, murder mystery with detect, you know what I mean? And people have looked down on that before and said, don't keyword stuff like that. But with something like that, either on their book somewhere, or I mean, like actually putting it in their manuscript or on their title page or somewhere on the KDP dashboard, would that help? Well, let's be clear. It definitely helps with Amazon's algorithm. Okay. Okay. Um, Having particular words in there, um, does boost their ability to believe like those words in your subtitle and title have more power than the seven Kindle keywords. So do keep that in mind. However, though, um, I think that there's a really good balance between convincing Amazon and also just making a better representation. So for example, some, especially in fiction, I think it's important for authors to help readers understand what kind of genre this is. So, for example, I'm a huge lit RPG fan. I love lit RPG. I read a whole bunch of it. <laughs> but there's nothing you can put on a cover that tells me this is specifically lit RPG. And for anybody who's never heard of it, literature, role playing games. OK, generally speaking, there's a lot of different flavors of it. I love lit RPG cultivation dungeon. That's my favorite term. Um, but for me, what that means is that this is where somebody is in a video game. And that they level up as they beat more characters. They, you know, they have hit points, they have mana, you know, they they get all these uh, points every time they kill a bad guy. The points, you know, add up and then they cultivate and they get the next level, right? There's nothing you can put on the cover that helps me to know that. Every cover of a Lit RPG book looks like a fantasy book. That's it. Like, and that's fine because that's what they are. So it's incredibly important for somebody like me who loves litter PG cultivation to understand that that particular book is a litter PG cultivation. And so I tell, especially like newer authors, hey, choose your title that that fits kind of your genre, you know, uh, Dungeon Madness. OK, and then in your subtitle, say a litter, an epic litter PG uh, cultivation adventure. Now, are you stuffing words in there? To an extent, yes, but you were helping me, the shopper, have a better experience. And I think that's where it's a it's a phenomenal play that is best for the market and at the same time strongly indicates what kind of book you are for both Amazon and the shopper. And I think that's wonderful. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shifting over to nonfiction. um, Yes, there's technically word stuffing. However, though. 
anybody who is in marketing, especially in sales copy, will tell you the best way to reach your audience is to use their language. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yes. if you're writing a book on like how to cure back problems and your market constantly says like sharp, lower back, you know, acute pain. All right. Well, that's the pain point. That's how I describe the pain I have. Mm-hmm. The solution is I want instant relief. And and the amplifier, you know, is is that immediately. So immediately relieve that sharp lower back pain in less than three minutes. Now, again, I just made that up on the spot. But notice that if I if the title was back pain, you know, uh, shall we say back pain um, destroyer, you know, or whatever, something kind of cool, like catchy. OK, got mm-hmm. it. But the subtitle tells me exactly what the pain point is, who this is for and how, you know, I can benefit from this. Are you stuffing words in it? Well, technically, yes, you're putting in words that your target market would type into Amazon when searching for a book. But at the same time, you're helping the market to understand, yes, this is exactly the kind of book I'm looking for. And that, yes, you're helping Amazon to say, oh, man, if somebody says lower, you know, sharp back pain relief, we should show this book as well. So sometimes those two things do play hand in hand. I would say, are you just stuffing words in there? Are you crafting a message that meets your market? I think that's the difference between what is what I would consider um, a savvy, marketable, but respectable way of handling that. Right, right. So just a subtitle that has good keywords, you know, good SEO words for your genre, but just not over the top 45 words being pushed in there, right? Right. Really, it's about how can you best serve your market and help them understand who what this book is about, who it's for, what it can do for them, um, and that sort of thing. And then I think you hit the sweet spot of of serving both Amazon and the shopper. And I think that's a wonderful place to be. Right, right. Like, for example, a while ago, I found a book um, that had a cover of a cowboy. I think it's a cowboy. It was kind of dark. And he's mm-hmm. sitting on the top of the hill and he's looking at what is either fireworks or ramparts, Okay. So I don't know if it's a civil war general sitting on a steed looking at the ramparts blowing up over top of a fort or if it's a cowboy watching a bunch of fireworks all alone. I have no idea. In the title of the book, I can't remember it, but it's a one word title, which, you know, is kind of a cool thing for like fiction books is a one word title. Mm hmm. However, though, I don't know what the book's about. I have no idea if this is a romance, if it's a cowboy, if it's a Western, if it's a Civil War era. I cannot tell. Right. Now, apparently, the author is kind of famous. And so people who know the author would know what kind of book it is about just because of what they write. But someone like me, a new person looking for their next book, would never get that. And so I think that the author, although they're kind of resting on their laurels of being semi semi-famous, not super famous, right? But semi well-known with a following, they're losing new customers because they're not helping me to understand what this book is really about. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. That's all really good advice. So, I mean, what else, what else should we be doing as authors? I mean, we've got, we need to go through our keywords. We need to pay attention to um, our subtitles, maybe use the words that our audience would use when looking, you know, typing in or looking for our books. I mean, What else? Do you have anything else you haven't discussed yet that Amazon's changed? Yeah. So um, one of the biggest gut punches to this entire thing is that out of the 13,000 Amazon categories that are on their system now that you Uh can choose from, which is cool, 27% of them are what we call a ghost category. And that means one out of every four categories is a category called a ghost. And what a ghost is, is a category where you cannot hit number one bestseller and there is no such thing as a category page. So if you don't know this, again, you have a 27% chance that the category you select will do no good. A shopper can't find it on the store. And no matter how great your sales are, you will never get the bestseller tag for that category. This sucks. I mean, imagine... Imagine the author out there that has maybe selected three ghost categories. Right. They will never get um, notified for it. They won't even show up in the bottom part. They're lumped in with a whole bunch of competitive categories. So I, I'm telling authors right now that 
a mass majority of them should 100% try to avoid these ghost categories. Mm -hmm. They will not serve your book. They will not bring you new traffic and they will not allow you to be a bestseller. So how do they, how do they avoid them then? Um, well, what really sucks is Amazon doesn't tell us which ones are ghosts. Of course. Yeah. Nope. Um, and they're, the way that you can try to figure it out on your own is that you need to go to amazon.com and try to find that category through their ca- so when you go to categories on Amazon mm-hmm. you look at there they have that kind of like path if you will so you click like you a know, little okay. tree yeah yep the tree you choose one and you keep choosing all the way down mm-hmm. if you do that path and you do not see your category that you're looking at in KDP show up that's a ghost category okay okay now, that can be really complicated, and there's a lot of ways where it might throw off the wrong information. Um, for those who own Publisher Rocket, this is incredibly easy because when you go to our category system, we have now tagged every one of the categories that is a ghost. So when you're looking at our system, you can see every category that Amazon has. You can see um, whether it is a ghost category or not, and you can also see how many sales that day you need to make in order to be the number one bestseller. And okay. so it just takes away all that kind of ambiguity. Right. Um, so I tell authors, especially those on Rocket, look, if you're looking at your categories and you see it's a ghost, just you should seriously consider not choosing that one. Right. So, so I mean, I'm assuming the reason they have these ghost categories is because they're relatively new to Amazon and there's just no information there yet. Are they ever going to make them not ghost categories, like create a, a page for them? No, what's what's really sad is, is that they're not new categories. Oh, they're um, not. And some of these are staples, like big names, like we're not wow. talking about super niche categories. Um, there's like, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but in paranormal romance, it's something like paranormal romance and romance is a ghost, which is kind of funny if you think about it, because, you know, paranormal romance is a ghost. <laughs> Touche, Amazon. Touche. Uh, but seriously, though, th- it's so it's not the 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 super unique or super niche okay. or small or new. Um, it's some big names. It's shocking what they've done to it. So I don't think it's because this is something where, OK, well, we have this new thing or whatever. We're not. Um, I believe. And again, this is where I'm going to hit. I don't have data to support this, nor my insiders have shared this because it's but like I said, it's also funny that they don't want this public. Like, right? Why, why? Okay, Amazon. Um, <laughs> my belief is that every time Amazon does, like, when they set up their category system um, on the website itself, they have to create that link tree we were talking about, right? They have to create pages and they have to index and sitemap. Uh, it's a big lift. Right. And I think that Amazon skipped a whole bunch of, uh, you know, steps and cut some corners by basically saying, you know what, we're not going to do this with 27% of them. Mm. I do think, too, that on new um, on new categories, uh, I do think they're lazy. And I think instead of if there's a new category, it's so much easier to just make it a ghost and not have to deal with restructuring their website. Right. Yeah. Um, I will say um, I, I don't mean to incite anybody out there, but just from a data perspective um, in some of the more political chart or politically charged or controversial uh, categories out there. It's very interesting to see that they're ghosts, right. um, a massive amount of the LGBTQ categories or any of the um, charged political ones tend to be ghosts. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that because maybe Amazon has, placated uh, authors and created certain categories, but they don't want them showing up. Right. Um, Again, I'm not putting words in their mouth, but it is a very interesting correlation between just looking at the data. I think it helps us to maybe understand why ghosts exist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not trying to push, not, not trying to (laughs) charge. I'm just trying to state data on that one. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I think that makes sense because, It has nothing, maybe even, maybe assuming that it has nothing to do with Amazon's beliefs politically. They're just trying not to push something that's charged further or something like that, you know? Maybe. Yeah. So I I think, I think it's a combination of they're lazy when they set up the system and it's just very easy that when they create new categories, they just don't have to worry. 
They don't have to put extra effort to change up the site map and the indexing and the website structure and things like that. They just, okay, mm-hmm. there it is. You can select it. You would think as big as AI has become in the last few years that they would be able to figure out how to get a robot to do it for them or something. I mean, do you think that there's anything we could do to change it? I, they're not letting us communicate with them, but you would think if authors threw a big enough tantrum at them that they would maybe do something about it. But is there even any way to to do that? Well, you know, I used to think that Amazon just doesn't give a rip and doesn't listen. Um, Mm -hmm. And then a while ago, um, there was that big, massive push about book readers reading a book and then returning it. Right. Right. And one of the organizations for books like really spearheaded that charge and they got Amazon to change it. So right before that, I would have said, no, there's no way, you know, like Amazon, I, in all the years that I have worked with Amazon, I've never seen them take input and actually do something. But on that particular case, um, you know, that makes yeah. sense. Now, granted, one way to best understand Amazon is I constantly say that, hey, ask yourself what makes Amazon more money. Right. Mm-hmm. So in that particular case, Amazon was like, yeah, if that person read the book, we should keep the money. So right. I'm kind of one of the, you know, there's a lot of times where authors like this is unfair to us. And I'm like, Amazon's not going to do anything unless that makes them more money. So, right. we'll, you know, them so you have to come up with an argument that is beneficial to them. Right. It's a cost based analysis, you know, mm-hmm. like, hey, how much would it cost me to redesign and, and create this AI system that could run amok and cause problems on our sales? compared to just making authors happy. Right. I would not (laughs) bet on that horse. Yeah. 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 I'm just, I mean, and again, I I haven't looked, so I don't know which ones are the ghosts and I have no idea if any of them are the ones I write in, but something like paranormal romance, that's a huge genre. You would think if the authors would get together, they might be able to make something happen, but I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't see it. I, I, the fact that they have, categories that literally say rename and yeah. then fix it. I really don't think they want to spend any more resources on this project. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they're going to go back just to, you know, make authors happy when it, when they probably doesn't make them more money. Yeah. It's yeah. a sad reality, but it is. Yeah. But it's not like it's anything different than we've come to expect from Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, yep, yeah, pretty much. Like I said, this was this was a novel idea, but to throw in these ghost categories is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing too that's come out of the category system that I think is important for authors to understand is there's also a significant number of categories that are duplicates. Okay. Um, now, authors don't have to worry too much about duplicates because if you do select a category that has a duplicate, the duplicates of it out there will just gray out and you can't select them. So you don't have to worry okay. about, oh, no, I selected two duplicates, which really means I get one. Mm-hmm. Two of my choices are gone and I only have one. No, nope, they stop you from doing that. Um, however, though, I do tell people that choosing a duplicate is actually a good thing. Um mm-hmm. And we mark every one of the duplicates in Publisher Rocket. So you can go in there, you can see the duplicate tag, and you can hover over it and then see all the other categories that it's connected to. Uh, The reason why this is a really good strategy is that if you, so, you know, you have the category chain, right? So it's like, let's say it's um, ebook, you know, fiction, sci fi military, or science fiction and fantasy, science fiction, alien invasion, right? Each one of those is a part of the chain. Mm -hmm. If, say, alien invasion in that chain is a duplicate of uh, fiction, literature, um, science fiction, and alien, and then it's a duplicate of another chain, what ends up happening is is that everybody who chose one of those three categories, they're all in the same alien invasion connection. They're all a part of the one. However, though, if your sales increase beyond just alien invasion – you can rank in the category in the subcategory above it mm. in all three. So you have a chance. You may have selected this the the genre of science fiction and fantasy, and you might do really good in literary fiction and get a bestseller tag in literary fiction, even though you didn't select it. Okay. So so I know that sounds confusing to kind of say over the airways. <laughs> um, a way for authors to understand this is selecting a duplicate allows you to have more chances to show up in more pages and to have more chances at getting a bestseller. So I recommend to people, hey, 
if you see a duplicate, that's not a bad thing to consider. If that really fits your book, yeehaw. Like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, good to know. Good to know. All right. Well, um, is there anything else that we need to know? Anything surrounding this that we haven't talked about yet? No. So just kind of in recap, because I know that's a lot of information. When you go mm -hmm. to select your categories, you get three choices. And the first thing I tell authors is make sure that one of your choices is not a ghost category. The second recommendation I give to authors is, hey, if one of your possible options is a duplicate, that's a good thing. Don't mm -hmm. don't run away from those. That's actually pretty cool. Right. Um, and finally, once you've selected your three, go ahead and collect really good keywords that fit for that category and use two of the seven boxes so as to make sure that you stay in those categories that you selected. If you do those three things, you will be far and ahead of 99% of the authors out there because most don't know this. Most right. are selecting ghost categories and they don't even know what that is. Many are, if they realize there's duplicates, they're avoiding them. And a lot of authors just select their categories and they leave it up to Amazon's algorithm to throw them into whatever they want. I, mm -hmm. With this knowledge, you can take control of that. You can ensure you've selected the best categories and you can ensure that you stay there. Right. Okay. Yeah, good to know. I'll definitely be going through mine. Um, so I will I will definitely link up, um, put a link to Publisher Rocket in the show notes because that is, I already have it. It's a great tool that allows everyone to really kind of uh, shortcut a lot of this stuff. Is there any other pages or links that you would like me to put in that would help people out with this? Yeah, I have an article on how to choose categories. Oh, and it helps to really walk through a lot of the things we discussed and kind of gives people a step by step. I think that would be a phenomenal um, article, especially for those that maybe are driving and hearing this and they yeah. want to recap. That would be a great thing to go to and follow step by step. I can't recommend that enough. OK, yeah, I'll have you send me the URL for that and I'll put that in the show notes as well. That sounds good. OK. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here and for doing all of this for us. I mean, if you didn't, then nobody would have any idea that this was even going on. So I'm really glad that you're here to to research this stuff for us and let us know. No worries. Like I said, you know, it, it's Amazon has been wild um, over the years. They've they've never really made it easy for us exactly. Right. Um, but I've also jokingly said, like, if Amazon made it easy, I might not have a job. <laughs> no, yeah, job my books would do you, better, for though, sure. So, you know, I'll take that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for being here. Any last words before we sign off? No, just like I said, check those categories, see what they put you in and take those those actions and start really benefiting from them. And again, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, yeah, of course. I love having you on. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Okay, I hope you guys liked that interview. I just wanted to come back here on the end and say a couple more things. Um, thank you again so much to Dave for sharing that for us. And after talking to him, I actually went back and looked at my own keywords. <laughs> and oh, what a dumpster fire I had in my hands. I did not realize how bad my keywords were. <laughs> Um, honestly, I have not published anything new in about three years, so it is fair to say that I'm a little bit out of the loop when it comes to um, anything new in the self-publishing, specifically the publication process, just because I haven't been doing it. I'm getting ready to publish um, the first book that I've published in a while here in the next month, but um, I don't think I realized how bad my keywords were. They they were kind of relevant, but <laughs> not terribly. Um you got to think of your keywords like SEO. They are phrases that are specifically relevant to your book and that your readers might be searching for in the search bar in order to find your book. OK, so it's really important. And I almost feel like, you know, I went ahead and went through everything like Dave told us to. And I actually do have Publisher Rocket. I would recommend um, Publisher Rocket for anyone who doesn't have it. It's a very helpful tool. So I went through there and pulled keywords from that so that I had really, really good sets of keywords and fixed all of them on my books. And I almost feel like my sales are going to double or something because my keywords were so bad before. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I'll, I'll you know, but um, yeah, I think it is a really good thing to do. And I think that if you are at all concerned about selling your book, then this is something you need to keep an eye on. So um, 
it's not the end all be all of marketing for sure, but it's really going to help support and supplement your marketing efforts. So for me, I do run ads to my books and I do okay, you know, some books do better than others, but I'm willing to bet that this will actually boost my sell my sales because I didn't realize that my keywords were bad. So um, in short, if you have already published books, however many, then go back through and check your keywords and make sure that they are up to date, that they are relevant, because that is really going to help you. I mean, I was probably hamstringing myself a little bit and didn't realize it because my keywords were so bad. So you just want to do that in order to help boost your marketing efforts. If you do not have a book published yet, then you're going to probably want to come back and listen to this once you do get unpublished so that you're starting off on the right foot with your keywords. And by all means, go check out that article. I'm going to link it in the show show notes that uh, Dave mentioned, because that way it's a step-by-step process that you can see. It's been laid out in article form and that's really really helpful too okay so as always i hope this was helpful go out there and fix your keywords and do some great marketing this week and i will be back next week with more i will see you then bye guys thanks so much for listening today before you go would you be willing to do me a solid if you found any value at all in this episode today would you be willing to share it with other authors just like you in the hopes that they might find some value in it as well happy story crafting this week remember Only you can bring the world the unique story that you are trying to tell. Only you can succeed in your own unique way in getting it out of your mind and your heart and into a medium where it can reach thousands if not millions of salivating readers. You don't have to worry about failure because there is always a market for awesome.